All right, guys, bang, bang, long time coming, but finally Eric is here. What, uh, what's going on, man? How are you? It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, lo- long time listener, first time caller. Bang, bang is one of the best you know, introductions to a podcast out there. Uh, glad to be here. Wait, before we get started, can we, you got to do the intro to your podcast. I saw people <laughs> tweeting at me. Come on, give, give us the quick intro. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode. So to village global venture stories, it's the everybody uh, accent that uh, that gets people going. But, you know, that's what people were tweeting. Company. They they love it, man. They love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right. So for the the couple of people who are watching who don't know who you are, let's just start with uh, with your background and kind of what you did before you got to Product Hunt. Sure. So um, I'm a venture capitalist and an entrepreneur. I run a venture firm called Village Global, and I'm chairman at a company called OnDeck. The, the backstory is I, um, I grew up in New Jersey. I'm a son of Israeli and Colombian parents. I went to University of Michigan, started my first company, uh, right at a college called Rap FM. It was like Zoom or, or chat roulette for, for rap battles. We we're, were trying to be Twitch for music, started with rap battles, uh, was solving a personal uh, interest and um, did that for about three years. Uh, we had some traction, but it was just early in the, in the live video space. And so... Um, it, uh, it didn't take off, but uh, learned a lot uh, through that experience. I met Ryan Hoover, who was the um, founder of, of Product Hunt. And uh, when I was leaving Wrapped, I asked him, hey, can I, can I help out? Can I, can I, I think that I thought that helping him out would be the best way to figure out what I wanted to do next. And so I uh, joined him. Uh, I offered to work for free. He said, no, no, I'll pay you. But my, my job title was Hustler. So I was a hustler at, at Product Hunt. And within six months, it had you know, got into Y Combinator, then raised $6 million from Andreessen. And then I said, well, I guess this is the next thing I'm, I'm doing for a while. And uh, after uh, Product Hunt was a, a two plus year journey, f- fantastic uh, journey. And I, I left, uh, right before I left, I started On Deck, which was a uh, dinner series for event series for people who were looking to start or join their next thing. And the next story there was basically, I started angel investing while I was at Product Hunt because I was just building my, my network like crazy, seeing all these deals, sending to investors and said, hey, I should start investing too. So I started angel investing. I started scout investing. And I realized that product hunt was just this unfair advantage, this asset that I could have to discover deals and then to get into deals. And I wanted to build more unfair advantages or assets. Like I'm not the the smartest person in the world. I, I need to have, uh, you know, I don't have other superpowers. I need to have these, these assets. And so I thought if I, you know, product hunt helps people with customers. If I could help people recruit or find co-founders, that would be an unfair advantage too. So I started on deck event series. Later became a you know ten week fellowship, and and we'll go into now it's trying to be a new university. And then I said, what would a venture firm from the ground up built uh, built from the ground up with the idea of unfair advantages look like? And that's when I teamed up with Ben Casnoka and Ann Duane and created a network driven venture firm, Village Global, which is a hundred million dollar seed stage uh, uh, venture fund. All right, so let's go to Product Hunt first. Uh... If anyone is paying attention to the tech industry, they, they've heard of Product Hunt, they've seen Product Hunt, they probably tried to get to the top of Product Hunt, kind of all these things. Uh, you were um, very early, I think even maybe employee number one. Uh, talk a little bit about like you saw a company that not only scaled and ultimately exited to AngelList, but also a company that was right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Like you had all those deals, you had all those products coming to you guys. Like what were the biggest lessons learned or takeaways for you personally as you saw that business get built and, and help really helped scale it to what it became? Yeah, there's a few lessons. One in terms of getting the, the job in the first place. Um, th- there's this idea that young people are especially scared to, to start company because they, if they will be a blemish on their resume, when be, uh, it's, it's something to be proud of. And there's a difference between job risk and career risk. Job risk is the risk that your job isn't there two years from now. Career risk is the risk that, that it sets you back. Whereas being a founder, actually, uh, it, it, it shows to other people that you know what it's like to be, uh, to, to be an entrepreneur, that you know how to recruit, you know how to sell, you know how to take risks. And so, um, you know, one thing, also as a young person, especially if you founded something, you, you don't necessarily sell, hey, look at all the things that I've done, uh, you know, in my life, S- sell your slope. Look look at all the things I've done in the last two months. Look at all the things I've, I've done in the last two weeks, in the, in the last year. I, I started here and, and here's where I got to. And uh, Ryan, in seeing that, it, you know, this sort of entrepreneurial spirit in me that was able to handle ambiguity, 
uh, th that was a lesson learned in terms of, that's why I think people should be more ambitious and more willing to take what I call asymmetric risks. Uh, and that's what I took while I was a product of this idea that your downside is capped. You know, if the product didn't work out, I would have still built this incredible network. Uh, but the upside is is uncapped. If if it was, you know, if it turned into this monster business, I would have meaningful up, upside in it. So one lesson is pursue asymmetric risks, learn how to sell yourself with slope. And then the other is I knew that I, I wanted to be an, an investor. And um, you can't really, if you're getting into the game, you need to have some reason why people want to take your money over the you know, sea of other uh, in, investors out there. And so being able to have an asset or a structure that really helps them uh, recruit or uh, get customers or raise money uh, that is sort of independent from your time. I mean, Product Hunt was this asset where I was giving or helping give, you know, dozens of founders game-changing traction every single day. They're, they're, like, there's there's nothing that that can compete in, in my sleep. And so, I, I for advi uh, aspiring investors out there, I really encourage them to think about what are other assets. And maybe it's you know, it's a podcast like 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 your podcast. Maybe it's an event series. Maybe it's a conference. Maybe it's a forum. Maybe it's some digital product that really just gives you gives you an edge. And so when you think through that, uh, I think people now say like, oh, no brainer, Eric's so smart. Like, look at all the things that he's built to give him those edges. Uh, I'm assuming that while at Product Hunt, you saw people build uh, lots of things, some that worked, some that didn't work. Any frameworks or kind of mental models that you came up with to, to kind of think through um, what actually was truly sustainable and, and kind of gave advantages versus maybe things that uh, they were shiny toys and, and would you know be popular on Product Hunt for a day or two but ultimately would kind of fizzle out. Like you, I feel like you just got a lot of reps in, in terms yeah. of not having to build the companies. You just saw them and, and any lessons learned there? Yeah, a few things. I mean, one in terms of sort of like building this edge or building assets uh, in the same way that I, I like the idea of seeing your career uh, as a product and, and focusing. Too many people try to network right away without thinking about how to try to get coffee with somebody without thinking about how do I add so much value when I get coffee with that person such that they'll want to keep having coffee with me or, or add me to their network? And that, that's the hard part. Like finding Pomp's email is, is not the hard part. It's being getting in his rotation, ha having something to, to add. And so in the same way that you, products and companies think about building moats, I, I advise that people think about building personal moats. So it, it, you know, th your personal moat should be unique to your talents and interests, something that's easy for you to do, but hard for others something that compounds over time and something that's hard to reverse engineer, hard for other people to do. So some examples I give, you know, Tyler Cowen has an encyclopedic brain uh, and the intersection of economics and politics and history. And, and you see him talk and you think, wow, I would have to probably spend a couple of decades to get to, get to where he's at. Uh, another example is Elod Gill, who's invested probably in a couple dozen unicorns. Angel investing is, sort of, investing is this interesting sort of inefficient market where uh, it takes many years to be seen as good, uh, even if you, you know, uh, so if you start right away, you won't, you won't know until you're good until for seven years from now. So for for someone to match Elod's unicorn count, again, probably have to spend a couple, couple decades. And, and then and then you, Pomp, building your audience over many years, a very loyal audience for someone to say, how do I become Pomp? I don't know. That, that's a really hard thing to do. And if you want to build a personal moat that, that when someone's like, how do I reverse engineer this? They don't even know where to begin. And so for you, uh, obviously, you learned a lot of this at Product Hunt. You saw people try things, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, ultimately, when you went to start uh, on deck, talk a little bit about um, kind of what that original idea was. Uh, and then it's really evolved over time, yeah. right? It, it kind of started out as this dinner series, or event series, uh, and now has very ambitious plans. But maybe talk just about like what pulled you guys in that direction. as you yeah. go the So one thing I really learned from, from Ryan is uh, pursue side projects because you, you never know what they can turn into. Product Hunt started for a side project. Ryan's documented how it was just an email list and then turned into a company. On Deck 2 was a side project. I was looking for my next co-founder. And it's, it's actually kind of hard to find a co-founder. People say, oh, it has to be someone you met in college or someone you someone you worked with. But um, there's, there's a lot of potential people out there. And so I started this event series to solve my own problem, which is how to find a co-founder. And then if you, if, if you, what I found is if you go down to your Dropbox, Facebook, Airbnb, Stripe, all these companies, and ask their sort of talented people, like, do you think in the next year you might want to start a company and might you want to be in a community to meet other potential co-founders? Nearly all of them will say yes. Like, it, it's just, it was sort of an underserved opportunity. So we started doing these one-off events. It was a volunteer community for, for a couple of years. We had sort of, you know, 5,000 people attend events in, in dozens of cities around the world, all, all volunteer run. And then what we realized is that 
we weren't necessarily having the compounding benefits that we wanted. Like someone in 2016 didn't have an easy way to connect to someone in 2018. And that's when we really started the fellowship, which sort of this accelerator model, this cohort model. We started last year. We've now had five of them. And um, accelerators are just so powerful for creating uh, creating long-term community, compounding benefits. It gets stronger the, the, the more people that, that, that enter it. And we said to ourselves, hey, we really know how to do fellowship for for founders, we then are about we're about to start this angel fellowship, but we realize like, hey, we're not just going after Stanford MBA, we're we're going after Stanford, and so th that that's the vision is to sort of be a digitally native, you know, university that, as if it was started in 2020, especially in the era of COVID, and so we say if Stanford is trying to teach people how to be citizens of functioning society, we're trying to help people become functioning citizens of the internet, and what what is what do you need to be a functioning citizen of the internet? Well, you might want to start a company, you might want to build an investment portfolio. You might want to write. You might want to have a podcast. You might want to build an audience. Um, so that's uh, that, that's our grand vision. And it's the thought process that basically uh, it's kind of like a um, futuristic school where literally like I, I sign up and I'm with a class and I literally learn from teachers or kind of talk a little bit about like what does that uh, experience look like for people who are participating? Yeah. So imagine, so our founder fellowship is, is like a Y Combinator or a Village Global Accelerator experience, but before you have a company. So you're looking for a co-founder, you're looking for startup ideas, or you really just want to be in that sort of accelerator ecosystem without giving up equity. We, 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 we charge a fee and that, that's how we make money. Um, and so imagine that model, the accelerator model applied to, uh, for angel investors, for, for writers, for podcasters, for YouTubers, for designers, for product managers. So what makes that experience powerful is a few things. So one is you get speakers from, from top practitioners. Two is the sort of group experience and accountability. So a lot of people who are going to our writer's program, they really just want to have this regular cohort. What, what, why I see the other accelerators that go do so well is every week you have to come and share what you've done, what, what you've shipped. And that public accountability, that, some people say that's like the best part of, part of the accelerator is really just week after week in front of very smart people that pressure puts uh, puts positive pressure on you to to chip and, and just get things done. So people really appreciate the cadence and then just up leveling the game. The same way you might go to fitness boot camps to see other people who are you know beating your butt and now like, oh I have to really step up my game and then uh, coming out with a finished product at the end. So we really think about how can we accelerate uh, people's goals and then you start to build positive network effects. So you know the first cohort of Y Combinator ever was Justin Kahn, Alexis Ohanian, Sam Altman. Right, they would go on to do incredible things together, and they would benefit from the following cohorts that would one make the credential more impressive. So going to YC is, is this impressive thing, but then also they'd be able to hire those people, invest in those people, team up with those people, and especially in sort of the COVID era, community is scarce, and so uh, the, the power of a fellowship to provide that ongoing community that just gets stronger is uh, is really working for us. Got it. What, what's the biggest challenge with building the company? Right. So you guys have kind of grand plans and, and things have gone well and you started to scale the business. What, what are the biggest things that keep you and the rest of the team up at night? We want to get to dozens of fellowships in, in the next year. We see COVID as the, the biggest opportunity uh, where people are just eager to have community, eager to have uh, fun things to do that are meaningful. Uh, and um, and the opportunity cost is is of their time is much lower. And so we're blitz scaling. Uh, we were you know, I think 1 million, uh, you know, run rate in May. Now we're five. We were probably eight people in May. Now we're 21. Uh, we'll do dozens of new fellowships. We'll probably, you know, quadruple the team in the next, you know, uh, year. And so uh, learning how to scale when we haven't scaled before is, uh, is the biggest thing on our mind. And, and But how to keep the quality high uh, w w while you're doing it. Got it. And then when a lot of people look at this, I think that they'll say, uh, this is a fantastic business in terms of all of the ancillary benefits. But how do you think of it as a, a business, right? What I mean by that is, uh, is this something that looks more like an events business and, you know, kind of a, a exit opportunity is there? Is it something that looks like, um, you know, consulting or teaching or education? Like, you know, part of the beauty of some of these businesses, they don't fit in a box. But yeah. when you when you kind of think through it, like, where do you put it or how do you think about the intersections of maybe some of these disciplines and what you guys are doing? Yeah, Th this business has really actually humbled me as an investor because it, it broke all the rules in terms of what you're not supposed to fund. So a chairman with a majority ownership of a company who's not full-time, 
who it was a volunteer thing for, for a couple of years <clears throat> in sort of this weird space. It's unclear if it's a technology business, if it's a services business. So many VCs passed on this business for all, for all the right reasons. Um, and it just turns out you know, that it's working. It's still early, of course. But in terms of how we see it as, as a very big business, the Founder Fellowship alone is a $5 million business. So 2,000... Uh, so 2,500 people a year will pay around $2,000 to be a, a part of this program. Uh, we think that we could do dozens of fellowships that are also multi-million dollar businesses on themselves. And then we think once we've done a lot of fellowship businesses, we can do a fellowships as a service product where we can enable other people to sort of build, you know, passionate communities, almost mini cults uh, around themselves and give them the tooling and infrastructure to, to, to do that. For, you know, there, there's a sort of saying that social networks are, you know, come for the tool, uh, stay for the network, like uh, TikTok and uh, Instagram or, or Musical.ly. But others are come for the network and stay for the tool or data that that network can generate. So Product Hunt is one classic example. LinkedIn is another classic example. Quora is another example. And I think we're doing something pretty interesting here too, where if you have, you know, tens of thousands of, of founders, of writers, of podcasters, like why couldn't we compete with Substack, uh, you know, What's defensible about Substack is the relationship with the writers, but we're, we're going to have these incredible relationships with writers. So that as a platform for different technology businesses that you could build on top of it is, is, is what gets me really excited. But even still, for the services business, the fellowships is what allows us to hire, to scale, we're profitable, we're, we don't need to raise any more money, uh, at least that's the plan right now. And, um, and, we, and the reason why I think people are willing to pay right now, partially because we've We've sort of established a, a strong community, and, and these businesses are very hard to disrupt. Like once you have a Y Combinator, once you have an accelerator that has you know a few cohorts under its belt, and people love it, it just it's very hard to compete with. Um, and, and in the COVID era, that people are willing to pay, they maybe have more money because they're doing less other things. Um, that uh, we think we could bootstrap a lot of these uh, cohorts in, in different categories. Got it. And so obviously you've taken a lot of these lessons around building moats and advantages uh, into the venture space uh, with Village Global. Um, you have uh, probably one of the most impressive lists of LPs. Uh, you've told the story before, but kind of give us the, the 60 seconds on just how the LP list came together, uh, whatever names you're able to share publicly. And then we can talk a little bit about the actual model that you're employing. Sure. So, so we asked early on, you know, how do we build unfair advantage or, or, or a, a network? at every level of the firm's DNA. And so uh, part of that was the LP base uh, where, you know, Ben Kasnoka, uh, uh is, is the former chief of staff to, to Reed Hoffman and is just uh, amazing at working with, with Reed and other uh, luminaries. And us three com combined with Reed and, and a couple others were able to sort of paint a picture of, of what sort of a, a new Allen and Company could, could look like, or a new Allen and Company meet, meets, a, meets a Y Combinator and sort of sell them, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Bill, Bill Gates, or, 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 and their, their teams a vision that this was going to be really strategic for them, that we were going to have, like a Y Combinator, we were going to have hundreds of startups a year that could be potential partners for them, potential acquisition targets for them, uh, and just keep them sort of fresh on what, what the latest and greatest is in, in, in venture. And so it was really a combination of, of luck and then selling them a vision that this was this more than any other venture firm was going to be a one could be successful, but two could be a really strategic asset for 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 insights and network intel. And at when they're at that stage in, in their career, obviously, sort of the incremental dollar is not as important as as the incremental edge that can help you know Facebook or Amazon or or, or Microsoft. Uh, so that that was one unfair advantage we thought about was, was the LPs, and we spent a year and a half uh, working with the various teams to to make that happen. And then we also thought. How can we really decentralize venture? So, so we had this thesis that um, venture is way too centralized. It's sort of this irony that venture capitalists are supposed to be capitalists, but sort of operate their business like they're socialists. Like it's one central planner saying, this is what the price of bread is. I, I know it better, you know, across every geo, across every sector, across every network. And, and we just saw that there was this explosion of complexity that there aren't just, you know, one person used to be able to cover the entire internet. You know, John Doerr used to just clean up, right? But now you don't have just subsectors like crypto. You have subsectors and sub niches within crypto, like privacy coins and De DeFi and all these different areas of expertise and, and networks that are cropping up. That there's no way that five people on Sand Hill Road could be masters of the universe and have expertise into all of them. And that you need to decentralize uh, not, uh, power decision making to the people who have the most knowledge. And so we have this network of 30 plus angel investors that we empower with our capital such that they can. Uh, express their local expertise, in, whether they're in a key network 
or key sector or key geography and make investments on our behalf. Got it. And, and so as you've built this out, obviously, um, you guys have had a lot of a success finding companies very early. Uh, is that mainly dependent on kind of this scout-like network where those individuals have that industry domain expertise or experience and, and they're kind of finding it and you guys are using that system? Uh, or are these things where uh, maybe you've built other systems or advantages where you're, you're getting some sort of deal flow so early, right? On deck as an example or other things. Like just talk a little bit about, um, it's one thing to find good companies or to find good founders. It's another to find them before they've started a company or literally, you know, in the early days of the start of the company, not waiting till the series A or, or later. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of it is competition over who can get there first and who can add value to the entrepreneur such that they're the first person they go to when they're fundraising. Cause it's an, as you know, it's an incredibly competitive market. So, so it's a few things. It's, it's the scout network that is out there. We have scouts that are embedded in different companies that we think have, have, you know, strong mafias and looking for the best people to come out of there uh, that own some of our scouts own specific conferences or have specific assets uh, themselves that enable them to to uh, be, be first call. And, and one key thing that we do relative to other venture firms is we empower them to make the decision often without our, uh, you know, our screening it. So th- th- we, by decreasing the friction, they can, uh, they feel more empowered to work with us than to send it to s- some other firm. But then also, you know, as I mentioned, unfair advantages, not just in being able to, to, to win the deal, but also in being able to evaluate. W- one thing, I mean, at the earliest stage, so much of it is people bet. And one thing we like to do is, is yeah, put them in on deck. Let's see them, over, uh, how they work over 10 weeks or for three months. What do they ship? Who do they team up with? Uh, how do they engage in the community? You know, we pulse the community for, you know, who are the most compelling entrepreneurs here? And that just extra data uh, gives us an advantage in when we decide to pull the trigger or not relative to uh, another firm seeing, the, you know, seeing them for the first time. And, and, and that time is accelerated. I think the first round had this stat that uh, a few years ago, it used to be 90 days between the first uh, touch point and term sheet. And now it's nine days. So th- these processes are so competitive. Founders are often going to other angel investors or founders before they go to VCs. And by the time they go to VCs, it's sort of like YC demo. It's, it's a spitting auction. So obviously every investor wants to avoid the bidding auction. Um, talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing with uh, investment round dynamics. So you just talked a little bit about timeline going from 90 to nine days. Um, talk maybe about the idea of firms versus angel investors versus kind of the solo capitalist trend. Uh, and then also what you're seeing in terms of check sizes, right? You know, if you talk to somebody from AngelList, they would say, hey, it empowers somebody to invest and then kind of syndicate the rest of a deal. If you talk to uh, an investor who's got kind of a very large capital pool, they'll say, you know, we're trying to take out entire rounds or, or whatever. So kind of what are you seeing at the earliest stages of investing that might not be as obvious to those who aren't in the trenches doing this every day? Yeah, a, a few things. One, I have this broader belief in that it's individuals, not institutions, <clears throat> and that people always, and, and that's not just in venture, but it's in um, it's in media, it, it's in a variety of different industries, that people just identify with the authenticity of, a, of and the specificity of an individual versus uh, versus versus a institution. And it, you sort of ask, why has it been that way? Well, it's sort of it's always been that way, but now individuals are just more empowered than ever, as you know, as you've covered in this podcast, to have direct relationships with, with their audience to be able to monetize directly from, from their audience. And you can sort of cut, uh, you know, and it's just, it's just so much easier to create a living and create an audience uh, individually. And that, that's no exception uh, in venture. That's why you're seeing so many people go it alone. So many people prefer to take money from uh, operator angels or, or solo GPs. They can just move faster. They have more specificity to them. And I, I think it relates to this broader trend within venture, which is the decentralization of venture. Instead of uh, this is my prediction for the future of venture. Instead of you know a couple dozen people on a cap table, you should have hundreds or or, or, or thousand, and in that way you could really unbundle the capital with 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 advice and get sort of people who are world class in different positions. It's sort of this is the increasing specialization and thus uh, de- decentralization, and we're already starting to see it. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of firms just open up space for small checks. You know, we just had a, a company. Um, that is uh, doing a, a is raising a monster round and is leaving a million dollars. It's a, one of the most competitive rounds in, in the valley, but leaving a million dollars for for their audience and doing it on on, on WeFunder. So um, I think we're gonna we're we're already seeing the sort of rise of individuals over institutions, and I think we're gonna see a lot more individuals coming onto cap table. Now, for sure, this is at the earliest stages. Is that seed at, at at you know 
at A, at B, these individuals don't don't have the capital yet, but um, I think we'll start to see solo capitalists uh, go go later stage as well. And so, explain maybe the psyche uh, of an, a founder who says, "Hey, you know, I have a really hot round. A bunch of investors are all fighting over getting in, but I'm going to save this million dollars for uh, that audience uh, or the user base." Is it simply I want them to have some feeling of ownership, and that will lead to more usage, and they'll go kind of be ambassadors for me? Is it something else? Like, yeah. why why would they do that? You know, th- this this concept of value add or even founder friendly. It's a it's a cliche now, but it's a fairly new construct. And it's telling in the sense that <clears throat> venture didn't need used to sell themselves to founders. F- founders begged them to take their money, but then capital became a, a commodity, and m- more people started to have it. You started to have a little bit of unbundling between capital and, and value add, and so now people really need to to, to differentiate. And <clears throat> it's still incredibly inefficient. The, the people who can often add the most value to your business, often other entrepreneurs, or, or, or other execs, they don't have the capital. They're not leading this, the, the series. They, like. Investors are usually generalists. They're rarely the person that can offer the most value for your company relative to the stake that 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 they, they take up. And so, if you're building a community product or a product uh, that really relies on evangelists, uh, you know, one of our companies, Rome, uh, is is incredible uh, sort of productivity uh, a product, a personal knowledge management product, and has the Rome cult. And for a community like that, to, who's so invested in it, also to feel uh, more invested via via ownership um, is just very powerful in in expanding its its moat. And I, I think part of the dynamic is sort of questioning, hey, you know, VCs, what value are you really adding relative to the people who can evangelize the product? And this was something that like crypto was, it was and is trying to do with, with tokens. You know, ways to disrupt these sort of network effects businesses is just incentivizing orders of more magnitude people to use your product and uh, and to identify with it and want to see it grow. So one of the interesting trends for me, uh, not only is one the social capitalist thing, obviously, but but two is this idea that uh, many times founders or other operators are the most helpful. Uh, today they don't have the capital like you described, but it doesn't seem a stretch to me for those people to eventually have very large pools of capital. And it, you know, do you see a world where um, you know there's been a couple of companies that have raised rounds where there's been no institutions, right? It's been all individuals um, and, and quite large rounds. So we're not talking about a you know half million dollar round. We're talking about literally tens of millions of dollars. Like, is that a trend that is accelerating, or are those kind of outliers? And you know, they're cool to talk about, but they, they may probably won't become the norm over time. Yeah, I um, generally I abide by the the rule of whoever owns the customer demand gets to capture the value, and founders would rather work with other successful founders than VCs on average. And right now, um, there's you know every industry is held back by regulations, and 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 venture is is no different. One of them is that VCs have long vesting schedules. Such that it's very difficult to to switch. You, know, you saw when Keith or Boy joined Founders Fund, when Sarah Tabel joined Benchmark, there's a sort of question of like, is this about to become NBA free agency? This like Kevin Durant, you know, going going to the Warriors. And the answer for right now is no, because the vesting contracts are just too long, such that they're giving too much to to do that. But I expect I expect GPs because they capture the value more so than the institutions um, that they work at, if they're stars, uh, will be able to renegotiate the, the, those contracts such that they're more fair and flexible. And then also accreditation, of course, prevents many uh, you know, entrepreneurs or, or many execs from being able to being able to invest. Um, but I, I think this is a uh, a trend that will only continue is right now held back by by certain regulations or, or, or practices. But once sort of the value capture reorients to the value creation, which sort of inevitably uh, ha- happens, even if it's a slow process, I think we'll continue to see it. You've talked before about generational theft uh, and this idea that uh, it seems like everyone's becoming a socialist. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I've talked about it from like every capitalist on Wall Street in time of crisis becomes a socialist, right? And everyone's looking yeah. for bailouts and all this crazy stuff. Yeah, I think you're talking about something a little bit different. Maybe describe a little bit what you mean there by generational theft and, and the relationship to socialism. Yeah. Well, I, I want to first say that one reason I'm so excited to build a new university right now is because universities are just in a really tough place. And I think that they are sort of ripping off their, their, their customers. I mean, think about an industry that has increased you know, 300% in terms of costs since 1980 without any verifiable increase in quality. College debt is now $1.7 trillion. Uh, it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme, 
We have a federal loan program funded by the taxpayer so students go into debt and then keep paying taxes to fund other people's debt. Uh, and, and then in, that's just the financial situation. In terms of the product itself, colleges, use, we used to sort of outsource uh, IQ tests and conscientious tests to colleges such that they were good filters of talent. But now we're getting rid of the SAT, we're getting rid of the GRE, we're getting rid of all these standardized testing. Uh, so it's unclear what it actually means to get into a university anymore. On, on top of that, professors are, are miserable, they're underpaid, students are in tremendous debt. And all of this is separate from COVID, which has sort of shown that the emperor has no clothes and that people are still paying the same amount of money for Zoom University. It just shows that you're really just paying for the piece of paper. And which we said, if they you know, stop serving as a good filter talent, it's unclear what that piece of paper is gonna mean. And, and that sort of begs the question, how can they operate this way? And it's because without any competition, there's been no university that's cracked the top 10 in over a hundred years. And, and that was Stanford. Any other industry that has terrible you know, product for its customers uh, or, or just costs way too much, you get competition. And it's because it, it's a cartel, basically. It, it's a government enforced monopoly that where they run the accreditation process, which allows them to sort of give uh, federal uh, uh, loans, uh, fed federal subsidies, uh, it, it tax shelters on, on an operating level and on an endowment level. I mean, Harvard has a $40 billion endowment. That's, that's a tax shelter hedge fund. So when we talk about generational theft and, and socialism, part of it is education in terms of the average person, I believe is in $29,000 of debt, but the, you know, nearly half Americans have under $2,000 of li liquid assets. So, yeah, and, and this debt is non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. So that, that's on education. On housing, we have a massive structural shortage. Between 2000, 2017, you went from about 11 million units of low-income housing to about 7 million. Every year, you're seeing 330,000 units of affordable housing uh, shortage. There's something like 17 million people who can't afford housing right now. So that's education, that's housing, and then it's healthcare. Like I said, people have like you know, under $2,000 in, in liquid assets, and yet the deductibles for individuals are like $1,500. So any health issue you have, it means you're basically financially ruined. And so it's, it's no surprise that when somebody says the system has screwed you to young people uh, and we, the government, are going to fix everything, whether it's you know, the right-wing sort of populism of, of Trump or the left-wing populism of Bernie or even uh, Elizabeth Warren, it's no surprise that people, people resonate with that because uh, you know, what's the point of capitalism if you can't acquire any capital, if you can't you know, get a house, if you can't get health care, if you, you can't pay for good education? So that's why people are so, so, so skeptical about it, and it's, it's the worst time for that to happen. Well, and I also think what, what's really interesting is uh, if you look at um, some of the non-financial metrics, like I saw a stat uh, today that said between the ages of, uh, I think it was 18 and 29, I believe, for the first time since the Great Depression, anyone between the age of 18 and 29, 52%, so we're over 50% now, live at home with their parents. Yeah, And, and I was just like, look, you know, there's the kind of cliche, oh, the millennials live at home, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, there's data that's supporting some of this. What we don't know is how many of those people it's, are COVID. You know, they let a lease expire, they moved home with their parents, and then they'll move out, you know, maybe the start of the year or whatever. But what I think you, you get to is uh, there is a very different relationship with capitalism, with money, with assets, with, you know, buying a house, all, all of these things that uh, I think are kind of like memes um, in, in terms of people talking about them, but they're funny and they resonate because they're true, right? And, and, and that's basically what you're describing here is um, that there's almost this like self-reinforcing system that uh, guides people on this journey between the ages of, you know, I don't know, 10 years old and 30 years old. And very few people kind of recognize, hey, there's traps along the way. And, um, you know, I love your framework of like the asymmetric career risk, right? And so what I guess, what are the attributes of the people that you see uh, maybe break out of that, you know, track that they're on? Or, or kind of what are the things that you see people do, whether they're actions or, or maybe some sort of attribute that does allow them to realize, hey, wait, this isn't the only path in life. There is something else that I can go do. Yeah. The, um, I mean, just to put a bow on your point, millennials were told that they'd be better situation than their parents financially. <clears throat> and they're not. They're, they're living with their parents and they see their parents doing much better. And so that's sort of the generational theft is, is this this lie that they see of of of, of what they envisioned was this was this American dream, and so now they now they blame the system, especially when other people are are providing them you know with sort of what I think are faulty solutions or, or recommendations. In terms of people who who get out of it, well, first it's it's don't walk into the traps to begin with. Now, if you can get into Harvard, I'm not going to necessarily tell you not not to get into Harvard, but if you're going to some third rate university and about to take out quarter million dollars in debt. 
maybe reconsider that. Think about wh- why you're going in the first place. Think about, and the, the, the crazy thing about the university is that there's also this sort of um, anti, well, so capitalist bent at the university. And so um, not all, everywhere, but in a lot of places, in a lot of departments. So you go to the university, you get quarter million dollars in debt, and then you're told that the reason your quarter million dollars debt is capitalism's fault when capitalism is the thing that's going to get you out of the debt. So you're both like financially ruined and also like sociologically, um, you know, just less likely to produce a big outcome if you think, you know, or to get out of that debt in, in, a, in a flourishing way, if you think capitalism is the, is the enemy. I, I think there's this new movement called progress studies that Tyler Cowen and Patrick Collison have, have, have started alongside uh, others, Jason Crawford, who are picking up the work. And what they're really doing is they're, one, they're trying to fight back in, in, on the university level in terms of providing viewpoint diversity. We, we, it's great. It's great to have multiple perspectives, um, inclu- including the, the one that exists currently. But then also what they're really focusing on is, is retelling the story of basically how did we get such a better standard and qu- quality of life? How did we get billions of people out of poverty? Uh, and the answer is basically markets, uh, you know, uh, uh, capitalism. And so by sort of creating this, this appreciation for, 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 for capitalism, for, for markets, for, for the power to get people out of poverty, to in, in invent new things, to, to change people's lives. I think so one way I see people doing is, is really appreciating the, the tools that are going to get out on an individual level, uh, but then also being able to tell themselves a story that once they get out on an individual level, I mean, see all the great things that people like Bill Gates and, and Elon Musk are, are able to do for, for society uh, that they can, you know, uh, not not just help themselves, but also uh, help society at large. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for young people today, right? So uh, young people are uh, in this situation, uh, kind of from a generational standpoint. Um, is it to go into tech and build companies, to go work for technology companies? Like if you're you know, 17 years old, 18 years old, you're graduating high school, what is that blueprint that you think uh, is, is just the better way? Yeah, so... You know, what's interesting about crypto in 2016, 2017, when it was really popping off, it, you see a lot of the, the funds that emerged out of it, or even just the people who are leading a lot of the projects, is a lot of them were, were young people, were people in their 20s, people who didn't necessarily have a lot going on beforehand. <clears throat> and it, that's not because they're smarter or because they're more accomplished. They're not. <laughs> in, in fact, but the reason was, was that they were more comfortable taking asymmetric risk because crypto looked stupid. Uh, you know, it, it, like Bitcoin it looked dumb uh, before. N- now we sort of nor- you know normalize it. We have all industry around it, you know, but it it really was the career risk for for people. Uh, and this is where we go back to job risk and career risk. The the less you have going on, the more you should be willing to take asymmetric risks because one, you're only known for the things that you succeed at, not the things you fail at. I I, I failed at Wrapped Rap, FM. A week later, I was at Product Hunt. No one cared anymore, and no one's ca- cared ever since. Reed Hoffman. Mark, Mark Andreessen, immensely successful people. Reed Hoffman started a uh, social network dating site that was a total failure. Social net, no one knows about it. Mark Andreessen started Ning, a social network for dogs, like a total failure. No, no one knows about it. So you're known for your successes and you want to take big swings. You, you really have very little to lose if you're in an okay financial situation um, and, um, and, a, and a lot to gain. So, so crypto was that in 2016, 2017. Today, what is that? What, 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 what looks dumb, but if it works, could, could be enormous. I'm really intrigued by income share agreements. There's a community that's working in charter cities that, that you know, building like startup societies, that, that's incredibly difficult, but could be enormous. Uh, virtual reality is, is always just, just around the corner. So um, whether it's starting something or, or joining something, I, I would look for where are things that other people think are dumb, but you don't think are dumb because that's where that's where the that's where the arbitrage is. Um, I would join something like On Deck or, or Y Combinator or, or, or Village Global Accelerator. Um, I would try to put yourself in networks such that even if your startup doesn't work, you've just built this incredible network. Um, but yeah, nothing is uh, better than than doing in terms of in terms of learning. So if if you don't have to be in college and, and you don't particularly want to be. And, and you're compelled by the idea of potentially starting a company, there, there are communities out there for you that, that, that will support it, and I would recommend it. Uh, geographies to do all of this. Um, you have uh, spent a, a good portion of your career in San Francisco. Uh, long or short San Francisco, and then uh, where else if uh, would you be long on? So this is the, um, the best time to live 
anywhere. I, I, I started talking about living on the internet. You know, it, it, we used to say it was, it was never less important to, to live in San Francisco, but you had more important to, to be connected to San Francisco. And, and a few years ago, you, ha- you had to be in San Francisco. But now most of us are living uh, on the internet. Most of us don't even know wh- where we are <laughs> when we communicate with each other. Most of our communication is online. So it's less that San Francisco is, decreases in, in power or the, or the rest rises in power. It's just that location matters less and less together, physical location, especially as companies go, go more remote because they've learned how to do it re- recently. Um, and what I'm really excited about this is that it's, it's an equalizer. You don't have to move to San Francisco or go to Harvard uh, to, to get your education, grow your network, or, or, or build, your, build your reputation. You, you, you want to be at the, the locus point of where all the activity is. Now, by all means, if you can move, sure, it, go to San Francisco. San Francisco is great, but you don't necessarily have to. What's more important is what group chats you're in, what, who you follow on Twitter and who, who follows you, what, what Telegram chats you're in. What does your digital ecosystem uh, look like? And you could do that for, from anywhere. So I asked for questions from uh, people on Twitter, and they sent uh, a whole list of obnoxious, ridiculous questions. <laughs> uh, I chose my favorites. Um, and I figured we could do some rapid fire and you just sure. throw out answers uh, as we go. Uh, the first is, um, I think on a 20 minute VC episode, you talked about from no one to VC in that path. Uh, what is the blueprint for somebody who is literally a nobody, nobody knows who they are, uh, but then they can very quickly break into venture capital? Yeah. So the, the first thing, uh, and this is sort of contrary to what people will want you to think, is um, you have to get numbers on the board. You have to start writing checks and uh, checks and building a track record. And it's because VC is an incredibly inefficient asset class. Um, you know, it, it takes seven to 10 years to be great. And not just because of the skills that you gain, but just because of the feedback loop to even know how you're doing. You can invest for two or three years, go in a coma for seven years, come back out and be one of the best investors in, in, in the world. There's no other industry where, where that's the case. Um, and, and, and VC is so reflexive where if, if you're known to be the best, then you get better deals. And so um, you know, it just sort of be, becomes true. And so you need to, to, to build that early. In, in, in basketball, for example, you could find LeBron James at 18 and realize, oh my God, th- this person's not, not only going to be incredible, but incredible right now and can dominate. We're, it's just obvious. The VC, there's no v- equivalent of a young person. You know, maybe they have a network and stuff, but you don't really know if they're good at picking for, 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 for years. So uh, my advice to people who want to get into it is find a way to write checks. And there are these things called scout programs where venture capital firms, we have one, give people uh, checkbooks to, to write on their behalf. Now, they give people checkbooks to write on their behalf to people who built a long-term relationship with these venture capital firms and have sent numerous deals. This is what I did at Product Hunt. I started sending all these deals to venture firms. And over time, they were saying, hey, this is inefficient. You should just write them directly. You have good good judgment. You have good deal flow. You, you just do that. So so. You want to add so much value such that they can't ignore you and it just becomes more efficient for them to, to take a bet on you. Uh, and then it goes back to build, building the asset, building the reason that you, you have access for founders in the first place or why they'd want to t- take your money. And it could be something like Product Hunt or On Deck or, or, or some sort of product that helps people get customers, recruit, hire people, get expertise, but it could also be an event series, a telegram group, a, a, a podcast. There are all sorts of these little different assets or products that, that you can build to, to, to get noticed and to get respected. Uh, you are a very, very big fan of rap. Everything from uh, the first company you started to uh, literally hosting Zoom freestyle battles. Uh, where did that love for hip hop and rap come from? And then what is your favorite instrumental to uh, rap or freestyle over? When I was younger, I wanted to make the NBA. I had no chance making the NBA. No, I, I, you know, most people give up that dream when they're like in third grade. I, I was like in 10th grade. I was like, I could still do it. <laughs> I, I was delusional. I've always been inspired by doing, uh, I've been inspired by agency, just the power to, to change your circumstances. And I've been inspired by the idea of doing something that people think you have no business doing or don't have natural skill set doing and showing them that you, through agency and hard work, you can get kind of good at something. And so rap, I'd always been a, a, a listener and, and, a, and a fan. And, and so what I just said, the agency combined with, I was a very shy kid in college. I went, I went to school in, in, in Michigan, in, in Detroit, I made, made a bunch of friends in Detroit. And I sort of saw people doing it. And I said, wow, I'm a really shy person. But if I learned how to do that, I bet I could public speak. I bet I could pitch. I bet I could sell. I bet I would just be so much more confident, so much more outgoing. And plus, it just looks like 
the most fun, fun, fun thing ever. So I've been doing it for, for, you know, almost a decade, a bit over a decade. And, um, you know, I'm not like a pro or anything, but you know, I could, I could hold my own, uh, in the, in the zoom open mics and, and we brought the open mic back. So wrapped FM ended in 2014. We got the same crew that we were rapping with in 2013, seven years later, you know, some of them were like 15 at the time, now they're 22, 23 on zoom every, every Tuesday night. And it's, uh, it, it's been, you know, enormous amount of fun in terms of uh, beat to, to rap over, um, the, uh, Nas state of mind is, is, is just a classic, uh, but uh, Drake has a lot of amazing beats. I mean, there, there, there's so much, uh, so much great stuff out there. I always joke. I think you're about the same age as I am. And uh, we used to like run home and watch MTV. And like the, some of the early rap songs I remember was like Nelly's Country Grammar yeah. or Nas, like Illmatic, right? Like yeah. all, all these things where you're just like, man, that was, or uh, no, Nas one mic, uh, where like the breaking of the glass and the p- police sirens yeah. and just like, for whatever reason, man, music just makes you super nostalgia, right? When, uh, when, when you listen to it, uh, what do you think that, or what do you wish that your smartest friends were doing more of today? I'm really inspired by people who, um, who think in public. Um, I'm, I'm in some of these private, uh, group chats where, uh, there's just, I would pay so much money to be, to be in them because I just learn so much from them. And I sometimes ask like, why can't this be on Twitter? Like it used to be on Twitter. Um, and, um, you know, for some of them it's for job risk or whatever. And it's unfortunate that, that it is what it is, but I, people benefit so much when, when, when you think in public and you help them sort of, uh, you know, think of ideas on their own, or they, they take frameworks and build on top of it. I sometimes think Twitter is like a GitHub for thinking where people are constantly putting building blocks out there that inspires other, other people when, when it's not a civil war, of course, uh, it's sort of, And so I wish some of the smartest people or all these people who are having all these fascinating private conversations, that they had them in public so that other people can, can, can learn. And when we create the systems that prevent, or sort of the cultural norms that prevent people from having those conversations in private, we don't, or in public, we don't see the loss. We don't see the dead weight loss, but it, but it's really powerful. Paul Graham had a post on this a few years ago, or maybe it was Jessica Livingston, the sound of silence. Um, And so that's uh, that's something that comes to mind because I've benefited so much from from people I I never met. You know, Tyler Cowen, who, who now I'm friends with, but for a decade I was reading Marginal Revolution and just hearing reading him think out loud just gave me frameworks to think about so many things and inspired so many thoughts. And so I, I wish others uh, did, did more of that. It's a great answer. Um, in terms of uh, the political impact or political instability, there was lots of questions around how does that impact VC? How does that uh, impact company building? Just talk a little bit uh, wherever you're comfortable in terms of uh, how you foresee uh, just the chaos that's going on, I think, across the political spectrum um, and how that impacts some things around tech and business building and investing. Yeah. I'm talking about a, a couple of frameworks I've been thinking about recently, which is basically in sort of Wealthy liberal societies, there's this fundamental contradiction where, between sort of the politics of safety. Uh, we want you know, ourselves to be safe. We want you know mur- murder rate to be low. We want you know people to to have comfort, safety, equality, and then at the same time, uh, we're interested in sort of the extremity of experiences. Our media and entertainment is about like Fifty Shades of Grey or serial killer. Like we're so interested in sort of this. You know, it's the uh, phenomenon where the car crash effect. We, we can't stop looking at the car crash, but we don't want to be in the car crash. And so the way that America solves that problem, that contradiction, it's kind of interesting, actually. It solves it at the level of virtual reality, but not at reality. So an example of that is Trump. You know, I don't want to get too much into Trump, uh, but it gives us sort of the uh, perception of an incipient fascist regime without actually delivering on, on the fascist regime. So we're all sort of like LARPing that, that we're in this fascist state. And similarly, on the other side, Chaz and all this, this stuff around the, the, the sort of some of the riots like Seattle and protests, you, you see videos and you're like, wow, is this a Maoist cultural revolution? No, it's not a Maoist culture. It, it, it's, it's LARPing. It gives us the, the sort of excitement of it without actually having to suffer the consequences. And, and there's some consequences, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not what people suggest it is on either side. And the real way you tell is by the body count. Like real revolutionary, real fascist regimes, communist regimes have body counts in thousands, millions. This is just in the, in, in the low dozen. I and mean, most of the war takes place on Twitter. And, and Twitter makes you think it's the, it's the French Revolution. But, but it's not. E- even the worst of cancel culture is a cakewalk in, in, in comparison. And so um, in this sort of crazy time, I, I, 
I come, came across this framework recently of sort of reality entrepreneurs. Uh, reality is sort of up for grabs right now in, in a big way. And, and what people refer to as community building, content creation, like what you do, it, it, that's a euphemism. It, it's, it's sometimes, it's literally people defecting the shared sense of mainstream reality that has existed for centuries and creating new ones. And at the same time that trust in institutions, in all institutions, is crumped, like who, do you trust the WHO, the CDC, like the New York Times, who do you listen to? It's it going back to individuals. It, it's it's people like yourself. It, it's people who are creating sort of their own sort of realities and, and communities and almost mini cults. And and, um, and there's just a, a huge opportunity right now to uh, to to do that. And and it's more important than ever because there's sort of this explosion of information, the explosion of intensity. Uh, and so people are outsourcing their sense making to to these reality entrepreneurs. And so. What does that mean? What does this all mean for investing and uh, and startup stuff? Well, one is any startup that helps people navigate uh, uncertainty or ambiguity. So reality entrepreneurial inter- individuals or institutions or uh, just chaos, I, I predict just more chaos. It's going to get worse before it gets, get, gets better, uh, whether that's private security, whether that's, uh, you know, co- uh, you know, uh, communities that that are sort of COVID specific that help you do sort of the equivalent of the NBA bubble, uh, but in private, I'm looking into that. Um, but then these sort of like almost new religions, and I don't mean religion in sort of the belief in God, but religion is sort of like a community that helps you make sense of what's happening, gives you a vision for the future, and then gives you practices and, and rituals around it. And maybe the 1.0 version of that was things like Soul Cycle and Barry Boot Camp and um, you know, Daybreaker and, and all these sort of communities, but the next level is going to be a bit more of a rebundling of, of, of what we used to have. It's, it's going to look unlike anything we've, we've had before, but th- those are some, some ideas. I think that you're dead on in terms of uh, this like rise of religions, but the religions aren't necessarily what you and I consider religious. Right, that there are kind of these other things around community identity, et cetera, um, that, uh, that that people just they don't recognize them today as that. But but I think in hindsight we'll see uh, they kind of replace religion. Um, there's a lot of questions around uh, attributes, and so uh, maybe the question to ask to kind of answer the most uh, in the most succinct way is just what are the best attributes on a founder perspective? What are the best attributes that you see in uh, investors? Uh, and then are those attributes shared. So if you are a great founder, you have certain attributes that also make you a great investor and vice versa, or do you feel like there's different attributes that make a great investor and a great founder? I feel like they're, they're significantly different. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of saying, I want to be a great investor, but I'm going to be a founder first to figure out how to be a great investor. Or I want to be a great founder, but I'm going to go work at a VC firm um, and figure out how to be a great founder. Often the best way to learn to do something is to do the thing directly. So some people believe this, but I, I think you don't have to be a great, great founder to be a great investor, and you certainly don't have to be an investor to, to, to be a founder. They're, they're, they're significantly different things operating at different levels of, of resolution. One of my favorite things uh, in, in investors is uh, epistemological modesty, sort of the knowledge of, of what their knowledge is, of how much they actually know about a, about a topic, about a person, uh, about, about an opportunity. Uh, and the answer is often, not, not, not as much as you think. And so how can you shore up your, your weaknesses in those areas? And so what sort of systems and processes can, can you build around it? I'm really interested in evolving this concept of venture for something that is just, just a craft to just something that is a, a platform and a product and, and a business and something that isn't just sort of uh, relying on great man theory but uh, really just leverages networks. So I'm excited about investors that, that know how to do that, that want to do that. And that might be different at, at different stages. Certainly at seed, I think, I think it's most important because it's, there's the least amount of data there. And it's also the widest aperture of potential opportunities. For, from a founder perspective, I mean, a lot of it is on founder market fit, right? Ev Williams is the perfect founder to do Twitter and Medium. And Travis Kalanick is the perfect founder to do Uber and, and Cloud Kitchens. But Travis would fail at Medium and Ev would fail at, at, at Uber. And so it's really just what's easy for, it's this understanding of what's easy for you to do, but hard for others. And, and I look for founders that have unfair uh, advantages, whether it's key relationships, key uh, expertise, or just key sort of distinct pro- product sensibilities. But then also uh, one general skill set from a founder is this really just ability to just zoom in and out. And so the zoom in is like, you know, what's the perfect email to send uh, in, in, you know, 
marketing copy or that converts and here's why it doesn't convert and really just get into the nitty gritty of the details. And then an hour later, zoom out into a board meeting and say, hey, here's how we think about the next 12 months. Here's what the fundraising landscape is. And to be able to communicate at that level of resolution to, uh, to your team is, inspires an immense amount of confidence because it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, the people who are doing the weeds uh, work won't be able to understand the the long term vision, but or the big picture. But they'll really appreciate it. Uh, and the people who are doing the big picture, uh, you know, won't really understand the weed stuff, but they will really respect that that you understand it. So that that's a way to differentiate. Uh, uh, accessing talent, right? One of the things that you've done a, a great job of is uh, on your podcast asking over and over and over again. Many people I've heard uh, just how do I find and identify great talent? What are the things that I think you've learned from either asking that question uh, or doing it yourself? So yeah, I have this, this broader philosophy of don't play the rat race. Don't enter the rat race unless you're the fastest rat. And so don't try to play tournament level games unless you could really win. And I, I was never an A plus. I never won the tournaments. I always said, how can I make the game unfair, uh, unfair advantage such that I can do even a B job and just, you know, win easily. And so on the talent front, you know, Keith Raboy, who's one of my mentors, ha has this line that Peter Till talk, told him, which is, if you're a startup, you're going to have to learn how to assess talent better because um, you're not going to be able to hire the same people that Facebook and Google are hiring. So you're going to have to hire people who they wouldn't hire or they wouldn't even think to, to go to or they wouldn't think to go there. And, and, and work with them and, and have them be, be, be fantastic. I think that's very hard to do. So the, the trick I've had is basically on deck. I, I want to uh, build relations with people over a long period of time so I could see them uh, in action. Another uh, hack I did is I started this retreat where basically I wrote a long list of all the people I ever wanted to work with. And m once you write that list, most of those people will be unrecruitable. They'll be starting a company. They'll be working at a company. They won't want to join. And what I did is I, I, I started this retreat. I would do it you know, three, four times a year, and I would invite all, all of them to retreat. And, and lo and behold, you know, three, four years later, I'm now hiring a, a bunch of them. Uh, and, and, and the trick there is it's one, I became regular top, top of mind for them. I, I uh, anytime they were thinking about a career transition, I became the person that they, that they went to. And you always with a, sort of a, a positive, some spirit, like, Hey, I'm just going to put my friend hat on. What, what do you want to do next? Um, and th that really inspires trust that you're thinking about them for, for the long term. And then over time, uh, once we ended up by introducing to the, each other, they became friends, they started to build relationships. And then once we hired a few people in that, that retreat community, now a bunch of other people are just sort of want, wanting to join. And so I think it's really just treating recruiting as a, as a long-term game. You know, communities aren't built overnight. They take years in advance. And same thing with, with great teams. It's the relationships that you build in advance and the structures that allow you to build these relationships with, with a bunch of people uh, over time. So I normally ask every guest the same two questions to end it. I'm going to add a third because I thought this was a fantastic question that was sent in, which is, uh, what is your favorite pre-podcast meal? <laughs> the, um, you know, I've really fallen in love with English muffins with peanut butter. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it is what it is. It, it's just, it just pumps me up. What's yours? Uh... I don't know if I have one single one. I, I, you know what? Actually, uh, living in New York, uh, you end up ordering food a lot for whatever reason, just because it's so so easy. And uh, there's like I don't know four restaurants. And uh, I was telling Plano one time that like it's pretty funny that we're at the point now where we don't even remember the names of the restaurants. Sometimes we just know like, oh, we want sushi. Okay, like just go and seamless and hit reorder, right? And you, you know, you, you start getting into this world of um, instant gratification, which is probably not a good thing. Um, but there's probably a rotation of four. I got like a Greek meal. There's a sushi meal. Um, you know, a couple others that, uh, that, that I go on rotation, but I will say, uh, here's a good one for you. My brother, when we were younger, uh, pop tarts, he used to cook them in the uh, microwave, not in the toaster for whatever reason. And he used to walk around our house telling us 17 seconds, 17 <laughs> seconds. That that's the perfect amount of time. And so we still, uh, to this day, give him a hard time about that. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, two questions to uh, end it. What is the most important book that you have ever read? Um, 
Nonviolent Communication is a, is a really game-changing book. It's a communication framework, not just for conflict negotiation, but for day-to-day -day life. They basically <clears throat> think of it like a fork of English, like a modified version of English that just maximizes the chances that you're going to uh, not make anyone defensive and you're just going to say exactly what you mean. Because, you know, sometimes you'll say something and it like is 99% what you mean and then 1% can be interpreted differently or maybe as a passive-aggressive comment. And then people just focus on that 1%. Uh, this just makes sure that your communication is super clear. So you're getting across what you want to say, but then nothing else extra that is likely to make them defensive. That, that's been a, a total game changer. And I, I recommend it to people. I love that book. Um, aliens, believer or non-believer? I am a believer. I don't know how one could not, not be a believer. I, the bigger question is, is uh, you know, do, do, do we know of their existence? Do they know of our existence? One thing I'm really curious about is why you know, it came out in the New York Times recently that uh, there are some files that they're, they're now opening. Why have the U.S. government tried to hide this from us? Because, I, And I, I think they're just trying to prevent commotion or chaos. But I actually think we need this. You know, there's this saying, you know, me, um, me against my brother, me and my brother against my cousin, me and my brother and my cousin against the neighboring family. So it just goes to show, like, we're going to have conflict. And I, ideally, it could be at the highest level of resolution possible so we can go here. And as we're having this conversation, you know, there's never been more sort of internal chaos in our country that, that since, since, since I've been alive, uh, we need a common enemy. And ideal, you know, ideally, like aliens would be way better than China. And so I say, release the information on alien. You know, there's this great uh, quote by Jonathan Haidt has this concept called Asteroid Club, which is if an asteroid was coming to Earth in the next two weeks, we, we would just stop all of our conflicts and just focus on how to, how to prevent this. And, and we would all cohere. And so I wonder if something similar can happen around aliens. While you were talking, I was literally thinking, yeah, like we have the common enemy of China, <laughs> but, but definitely agree that aliens would be much better. Uh, so all humans can, uh, can come yeah. together rather than uh, just be uh, imaginary lines in, uh, in a map. Um, you could ask me one question to end it. What do you got for me? Yeah, I, um, I got a couple, if you don't mind. So COVID could be the opportunity for, for crypto. I mean, you know, it, trust in institutions is at an all-time low. Uh, and so what is crypto all about? It's all about trust, trust, right? So uh, governments have shown that they're incompetent. So it's an opportunity for charter cities. The media has shown that it's sort of cynical or, or can't really predict uh, what's happening and won't even admit it. So it's an opportunity for prediction markets. And then we've shown that we'll just print our way through anything. And so that's the opportunity for Bitcoin. How do you sort of think about the, the game plan or the opportunity for crypto in, in a post-COVID world? That's one question. The second question, is sometimes I advise people to take the pomp for X career path. You know, you, you made a name among other things, just going taking asymmetric risk on Bitcoin. You just, you know, there's this quote of, I fear not the person who said, you know, a thousand different things, uh, but said the same thing a thousand different times, a Bruce Lee modified quote. And, and that's you with Bitcoin. You were really early on that and made a big bet on it and it really paid off for you. And so what are other spaces that people can do that? And how do they sort of be the, the pomp for X? I see your, your brother doing that in sports and he's doing it phenomenally. Uh, so crypto in a post COVID moment and then uh, pomp for X opportunities and what advice do you have for people who are looking to take your path in different spaces? Yeah, so crypto, I think uh, is this weird thing where everyone wants it to happen now, right? And, and you know, I'm always kind of careful now to say like Bitcoin is a multi-decade type thing, if it fully fulfills the promise of kind of next global reserve currency, et cetera. And, you know, people hear multi-decade and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. Like, I'm down for that. I'm like, no, no, no. Just so we're clear, that's like 30 plus years, right? Like, like that's a really, really long time horizon. Uh, and just humans are really bad at, you know, there's the Bill Gates quote of like, we overestimate one year, underestimate 10. Now bring that out to like 30 years. And it's, you know, very hard to kind of predict where we're going to be and, and also have the patience to, to do that. Um, so I think that uh, when you kind of zoom out, and you look at where are we, it's like actually like we're way ahead, I think, of where most people thought we would be at this point. Um, and now you've got this like macro tailwind uh, right into a halving. There's probably going to be this, you know, really big price um, kind of upward movement uh, in the next 18 months. And what's interesting to me is like pretty much every time this has happened in the past, there wasn't a lot of people paying attention. Like the last one kind of brought people's attention right in 2017, where like the media started being like, wait a minute, like this thing is actually going to $20,000. Like that's insane. And you saw kind of the articles and you saw the ICOs and kind of all, all of that, you know, hype and excitement. Uh, if it happens again, like I think it's going to happen now, it's like everyone's already paying attention. 
right? And so it's just going to be that on steroids, which, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of bad parts to that, but, but I think um, really kind of thrust it onto a global main stage. So, so that'll be interesting. Um, I definitely agree with this idea of like crypto in a post uh, COVID world being um, essential. Like I, I talk a lot about like centralization now is becoming a business risk. So whether you look at it like, you know, TikTok being potentially banned from the United States all the way to um, just trusting, you know, do you trust the cloud providers with your data, all that kind of stuff. Um, figuring out how to be efficient and decentralized uh, is going to be hard for a lot of people um, across the, the technology stack. But I think that's just going to become a, uh, a necessity. Um, well, I can say one thing on that real quick is fascinating. You know, the, the conversation a few years ago when Chris Dixon had his post of why decentralization matters, it was really focused on sort of the, the Zynga Facebook use case, which is the platform risk as a company you take on, on somebody else's platform or a user when you don't own your own data. And it was really this, this risk that the platform would screw the user. And it's so interesting because now we're in sort of the era of cancel culture. We're seeing platforms want to decentralize themselves to not have a risk of the user ruining their brand. And so it, it, it's like now they can cede responsibility a little bit and it, from having to make a really tough, you know, editorial decision or, or being, you know, uh, sort of motivated by the mob. And so I, I think that that is a fascinating transition. Yeah. And, and look, I, I actually think it, just like Bitcoin is kind of different things to different people, same thing here. Decentralization serves like different benefits to different people as well. Right. So, so it's always like we like to put things in a box and say like, oh, it's because this is why this is valuable. But at the end of the day, these are like very complex systems. So I think generally like that's the trend and, and it'll only accelerate. It won't uh, kind of uh, retract at all. Uh, in terms of the pomp for X, I think it's first of all hilarious that you uh, you call it that. Um, I, I really do agree with this idea of like, taking a early bet on something that you truly believe in. Like, like if you're not authentic about it, then you know, you're dead on day one. Um, but there is this benefit uh, that I had obviously with Bitcoin kind of, you know, it going the way that it went. Uh, other people have done this in, in certain verticals. Uh, my brother's definitely a great example. I think of just, um, you know, I joke with him all the time. Like what he's doing is not necessarily new. Like Darren Rovell did this 25 years ago. It's just that like you and me are probably on the lower end of the generation that remembers Darren Rovell, right? When he was at ESPN and kind of all this stuff. But like some of the stories that my brother will tell, like literally Darren will like, you know, tweet out and be like, I told a story 18 years ago, <laughs> right? You know, I've, I've written this article three times. And so it goes back to like, it's not necessarily just like having to do something new as much as it's like having a very specific focus, telling people like, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to cover the, you know, in his case, the money and business behind sports and then just drive at it every single day and just like, kind of just like beat people over the head with it. Right. And, and what you almost end up doing is, um, who is it? Superhuman, I think did a great job of this early on where they were like, I don't want as many users as possible. I want the right users. Like that's basically what you do with that repetition is you end up like getting rid of everyone who was kind of like a half fan and you just get the people who like they can't eat, you know, soak up enough of the content. Uh, and that really builds kind of engagement and, and, and distribution, all that kind of stuff. Other areas that I think it's interesting. Um, so one, definitely in education, I think there's going to be this massive uh, kind of um, resurgence of all kinds of education. So you're talking about like, you know, what does a digital first kind of university look like? You can basically take every single subject that you would have in high school or in college, and somebody's going to be that person teaching millions of people on the internet, right? And that historically, like, it was kind of cheesy if someone was like, oh, like I have a YouTube show and I teach people American history. Like nobody really cared, but actually that, that can be built into a massive business now because the tools um, and software are in place where you can do everything from subscriptions to advertising, to physical products, to, you know, virtual events, like all that kind of stuff. And so I think just go through your high school, like uh, curriculum and every single course will uh, turn into a business. Uh, another area I'm fascinated by is uh, the, all of the technology verticals that benefit from taking supply chains and manufacturing facilities and bring them back on shore. So if you've got to bring, you know, your manufacturing or supply chain back, uh, you can't use American labor because the cost is too high and it becomes cost prohibitive. So you've got to use technology. So there's like this resurgence of 3D manufacturing, um, you know, 3D printing, um, all, all kinds of things around just robotics and automation, whatever. Um, I think that's an area that we all kind of know is like, it's cool. It's going to be a thing. I couldn't tell you the first thing about it. And so like, if I knew that there was a person who was like, that's the 3D printing guy, right? Or, or that's the 3D manufacturing woman, like you just naturally gravitate towards them if that's what you want to learn about. And so you can kind of own entire verticals like that. Uh, and then the last thing um, is 
I don't have enough thoughts to know what the answer is, but an area that I think is really interesting is creativity. And so creativity kind of cuts across all industries. Like you, you want somebody who is creative, but school's like the last place to teach you how to be creative. Right. And so like, I don't know yet know what the solution is. Like, is it just some like revamped version of like an educational, you know, uh, situation where like, I'm a teacher, you're all on zoom and I teach you how to be creative. Probably not, but there's gotta be something that people can do to like, how do I drastically pull you up the creative like spectrum or, or curve so that you engage with this product, this, you know, service, whatever it is. And now you feel like you've become way more creative. My guess being that that's one of the most viral businesses in the world as well, because if all of a sudden you start talking to me at a, a party and I'm like, dude, that guy's super creative. You're like, oh yeah, I took this course, right? Like it's something that like people want to brag about because creativity in our society is still uh, put on a pedestal to some degree as well, right? Like, like it's like, oh, you're wealthy or like you're an artist to some degree, whether you're a musician, or like a physical artist, whatever, like we still hold that in high regard. Um, and so I don't, you know, first of all, if you have ideas or if anyone listening has ideas, would love to hear them. But, but I think that that's like the other area uh, that's really interesting because again, it, it's also the thing that is the farthest away from being disrupted by automation, machines, et cetera, right? It, it's got kind of this like inherent moat that uh, we at least like to believe that we are, uh, you know, the most creative animals, but after uh, GBT three or whatever, yeah. like, you know, m maybe not. <laughs> I, I think part of it is, is just doing it. Devala, this old tweet of the desire to, it's not the desire, it's not the education that is scarce. It's a desire to learn. Uh, and, and similarly with, with, with projects. Uh, and that's what, you know, on deck is really trying to have project based cohorts where you've said you wanted to have a podcast for a long time. You said you want to a YouTube channel. You said you wanted to do uh, a, a startup. You said you want to start angel investing. What are all the bottlenecks? that prevented you from doing it here's where that stops like you are going to start you are going to ship something you're just going to start start trying it and then just your point on, on pump for x or, or, or our point on it it's it's never been a better time to be a creator in terms of monetizing even stuff that's come out in the last few weeks like the the rolling funds i, I think is, is game changing if you have an audience based on your writing or you have a course one if you have a right if you have an audience based on your writing you can start a course you can make money off that then you can also they, people trust your judgment. You can start a fund and invest in people that you're that you're you're seeing or, or starting. And so I'm seeing a lot of creators pursue that path, and uh, and 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 it's, and it's very exciting. Listen, you're welcome whenever you want. I'll do this forever with you. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Find out more about Global uh, or Village Global, and also uh, on deck. Uh, VillageGlobal.vc, uh, BeOnDeck.com. Follow me on Twitter, Eric Tornberg. Uh, Pump, when I talk about personal moats, your name comes up because to reverse engineer what, what you've built over the past few years is, is immensely difficult. Mad respect. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to know you, be your friend. Uh, I'm uh, uh, stoked you had me on the show. Thanks a lot. You're, uh, you're way too kind, my friend. We'll do it again soon. Awesome. Okay. <laughs>